to give. And I want to welcome up uh, Pastor Edgar, Pastor Fuego, uh, Spanish for fire. <laughs> Our Spanish pastor, we love Pastor Edgar. Oh, man. Let's welcome him up. Can everybody stand to their feet, please? And I think there's one here that deserves a, the greatest applause, the greatest honor, the greatest glory, and that's the name of Jesus, King Jesus, Jesus. It will always be Jesus. It will always be Jesus. Come on, come on, we can do better than that. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for today. Thank you for your divine presence. We give you the glory, we give you the honor, oh God. And Holy Spirit, we make room for you. We thank you. We thank you that you have it, you that you will have this place, that you will have our hearts, that you will do what you need to do in our lives. We just give you the glory, Holy Spirit. Thank you for being with us. For you are always our guest speaker. We honor you. We glorify you. Because without you, where would we be? It is through you, Holy Spirit, that we are marked with a seal that we belong to our Lord. It is you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. We thank you. We magnify you. Do what you need to do in each individual today. I thank you that in this moment, as I begin to speak, as I begin to move, I, be I declare right now that your word will begin to penetrate every heart. I thank you for this youth, this youth that's on fire right now, this youth that's rising in this generation because this generation needs you. This generation needs you. We thank you, Lord. And I thank you for those father figures, the, mo the mother figures that are out there. You're not done yet. There's still a generation that needs you, that desperately needs you. I thank you right now, Lord, as we come here before you to give you the glory and the honor that you will do what needs to be done today. And let's give another round of applause to the Lord. So today I have the privilege of filling in for my pastor. Pastor was uh, on vacation, getting refreshed. You know, we all need that from time to time. It helps. It's, it's something we, we all need to do. It's kind of like preventative medicine. Helps you so you don't burn out. But that you burn up, you continue. It just fills you up. Um, you can go ahead and take a seat. I also want to honor my, my wife. My beautiful wife's here with me, Pastor Adriana. Here in the front seat. You know, as I was, uh, like I shared with the 9 o'clock service, there's always, I'm always asking the Lord, what is it that you want me to teach? Even though Pastor Marlano had told me in advance, you know, that if I could fill in for him today. And sometimes I don't know until the time gets closer, until the time is approaching. And there's been a little bit of a shift in the Spanish service of what I've been doing. Um, I've been teaching every Sunday something different. It hasn't been a series. It's just something what God shifted me to. And it was, it's been kind of like the rhema word of what God's been giving me in my devotionals. Man, I had this one a while back ago, a few months ago. And I didn't know when I was going to use it or if I was ever going to even teach out of that subject. But um, as, as the time was approaching, that's what the Lord was leading me. He's like, I want you to teach that. And I'm like, okay, I'll be obedient. That's what I'll, I'll teach. And so um, one thing that I noticed that every time there's a fire, whether it's a house fire, a commercial fire, whether it's even a car fire, if for some reason it draws attention. And as something's burning, all of a sudden people, the, ne the next thing you know, the neighborhood is out there. The next thing you know, people from the woodworks are out there. All of a sudden they're coming, they're drawn because what? They want to see what's burning. They want to see what's on fire. And you got a multitude of people out there watching something burn. And fire is attractive. That's what the Lord used to attract Moses. Moses saw a, a, a bush caught on, that was on fire, but he even said to himself, how is it that this bush is on fire, but it's not being consumed? So the Lord knows how to attract you. 
He knows what will attract you. He knows your language. He knows your love language. He knows what makes you tick. He knows what every detail of what, even the things that you would never thought of that or could even imagine that he would know. He knows it all. He knows every detail. So that's how we ended up using this in order to attract Moses. So John Wesley was a revivalist in the 1700s. And they're going to put a picture in the back. And this, uh, this was a picture of uh, John Wesley when he was six years old. He was trapped in a burning house, and he was only rescued when one, na- when, when one neighbor climbed on another's shoulders and pulled him out of the window. A picture of the scene was then drawn for Wesley as he kept the drawing until he died. But underneath the drawing, the copy that he has, he ended up um, writing on it, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 2, and he put this phrase underneath it, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Zechariah chapter 3, verse two, uh, 2 through 3 says this, And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. So today I will be touch, uh, teaching you out of the subject, plucked. So listen to what I'm going to say, plucked. Out of the fire. So I'll be t- teaching to you out of plucked out of the fire will be the subject. And the first point that I want to talk to you about is attracted to filthy garments. Attracted to filthy garments. Why attracted to filthy garments? Because that's what the enemy likes. He's attracted to filth. He's attracted to when your garments are stained. Why? Because then he can use that to accuse you unto the Lord. And you may, you may ask, well, how does he do, how does he do this? Well, he, he ends up, he has access to the heavenly court. And in Job chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, this is what he says. The Lord says, One day, one of the members of the heavenly court came again to present themselves before the Lord. And the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where, where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. And Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that is going on. So he has access to this heavenly court. And here was Joshua, one of the high priests, that all of a sudden he's presented right in front of the Lord and his garments are filthy. And Satan is right there. He's right there to point out that his garments are filthy and dirty. And that's what the enemy likes to do. He likes to point out your filth. He likes to point out that you, that you did this, that you messed up, that all the things that you can even think about, people that don't even know. And that's why the enemy's out there accusing you. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, the Bible tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren and that he accuses us day and night. He doesn't rest. He's always accusing. He's always accusing the brethren because that's what he does. Has anybody went or has has anybody gone through a phase or, or this happened to you where all of a sudden somebody accused you of something that you never even did, but they were accusing you? And they told one person, they told another one. And then the first thing that they say, oh, isn't he a believer? Doesn't he go to church? Oh, doesn't he serve? Doesn't he do this? Well, that's the same voice of the enemy, just ready to accuse you. The one thing that I always say is if there's accusations, let them come as long as they're not true. Let the accusations come as long as they're not true. The voice of the enemy always has accusations. He brings condemnation. Everyone's garments have been at one point stained. And that's what demonstrates that you were in that fire. You were in the mist. There was stuff that you were going through. There was a storm that you went through where nobody knew that you were maybe going through or maybe people saw it and that it should have destroyed you. It should have done something with you. It should have taken you away. It should have taken you out. It should have crushed you. You were in the wine press. You were in the mist of something that was a pressure all over you, everywhere, where you didn't know what to do. But it was in the midst of that pressure that that's when God came in. That's when God plucked you out. That's when God began to do something amazing in your life. See, people can argue with you all the theology they want, but they can never argue with you your personal testimony and what God has done in your life. Because that's something personal. That's something 
that demonstrates that you have a relationship with the Lord. That's when you can say, hey, uh, the Lord took me out of bondage of alcohol. The Lord took me bondage out of pornography. The Lord took me out of this, this, and that. Why? And it pulled you out of that because of the same reason you were in the midst of this filth. Yeah, people could have pointed out, and people sometimes still point it out. Oh, I remember how he was. And you said it was, because I'm no longer that. I still hear it today. I've heard family members. Oh, I won't, I won't hear him preach. Because I know what he has done. I know how he used to live. Well, that's my testimony. That's where God pulled me out of. That's to show you that God can use anybody as long as they're obedient, as long as they're broken, as long as they come to the Lord. And I'm here to talk to somebody that's been through the fire, that has been in the mist, that says, I don't know if I was even going to return, if this was going to be the end of me. But there was a time where I was in that place, where I was like, Lord, I'm rubbish. I'm, I'm the worst of the worst. I deserve it. But God touched me. God reached out for me. God began to do something. And as he begins to remove that filth that gar uh, of those garments, what he does, he, he plucks you out like that brand, plucked out of the fire. So this is my next point, plucked out of the fire, but still on fire. Now I want you to repeat it after me. I have been plucked out, but I'm still on fire. But I want you to say it like you mean it. I want you to say it like you've been through stuff. I want you to say it like you've been through some storms. I want you to say it like you've been in deep waters where you know that if it wasn't for the Lord, who knows where you would be. If it wasn't for God, where would you be? So I want you to repeat it after me. I have been plucked out of the fire, but I'm still on fire. And that's what you got to tell the enemy. That's what you got to remind the enemy because he's trying to snuff your fire out. That's what he tries to do. And I didn't say this in the, in the, in the 9 o'clock service, but if you go into the book of Acts chapter 28, when Paul was shipwrecked, when the moment he went ashore, they, they did a fire. They built a fire to warm up. And out of the fire, a viper comes out and, and snatches on and begins to bite the apostle Paul. And the apostle Paul, what he did, he shook it and threw it back in the fire. Yeah, the enemy is attracted to fire too. And he wants to put your fire out. Every time he sees a brand that's been plucked out, he wants to bring it back to that which was burning. But for him, that he was trying to destroy them. He's trying to destroy you. Don't, 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 don't think that he's being all nice because he brought this girl in here. All of a sudden, hey, look at her. Oh, she, she wants your attention. Comes in wiggling in. Or maybe those male gigolos that come in too. They're all dressed up, all nice. They got the nice car. They got this. But you don't know how they're living. You don't know how they're living. You don't know that they're over there selling drugs, doing drugs, prostituting women. You don't know that. But I want you to know is that, and I want you to get to a place where you've tasted the presence of God. Where all of a sudden you know when somebody smells like they've been in the fire, they've been in the presence of God, they've been submerged in the presence of the, the glory, they've been submerged in, the, in his presence, where all of a sudden you know the difference. Where you can pick out the phony from the person that has been in the presence of God. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were put in the furnace. The king told him, I want you to crank it up seven times even hotter. They cranked up that oven, and then they put these three men in there, but the ones that got burned were the very guards that put them in. And the Bible says, I want you to say, and the Bible says, in Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, the Bible says that the king saw a fourth person in there. See, you may have been in the fire, 
You may be in a drought where you've been going through the valley and you've been going and you're like, nobody's around. These people left me. They backstabbed me. They abandoned me. But I want you to know that there has been always one by your side. And that one that's by your side is more faithful than anybody can be. And if he is on your side, who can be against you? Who can be against you? Hey, greater is he that is in me than he who's in the world. I came to rattle the earth. I, oh, don't get me started. Don't get me started. Because I'm here to preach to those that have been through the fire. That have been in the thick of it. That says, where would I have been if it wasn't for the Lord? I would have been in the cutter. I wouldn't be standing. I could have wrecked one time when I was so drunk that I didn't even remember how I got home. Where there you'll always remember, what did I do? Did I do something? Always that in the back of your mind. And you're wondering, can I make it again? And then you're like, okay, I'm done, Lord, I'm done. And then the weekend comes, and then here comes the friend. Hey, there's this party. It's going to be popping. Hey, we can go clubbing after that. And then all of a sudden, here you go back into that same cycle. You, come, you go back into that same cycle. And then you go, you're falling back and you're using grace like grease. And thinking that, oh, it's all fine and dandy. But one thing that I've learned is when you really have tasted the Lord, you can't go back to the crumbs of the world. You can't go back to the crumbs of the world. Why? Because you've tasted the bread of life. You've tasted the loaf. You've tasted them. I've heard of people that have literally have tasted. They're like, man, I've, there's something sweet. I could taste the presence of the Lord. Where they could tangibly feel it and taste them. Where you could smell his fragrance. I've had the opportunity to smell the fragrance. It's addicting. You want more of him. That's why the Bible says, come and taste how good the Lord is. Come and taste. Come and taste. Provoke. You want to taste them? Provoke. Provoke. Get in that secret room. See, the reason why sometimes people go going through these droughts, it's because they stop watering that secret room with their tears. It's no longer watered. It's, no lo it's dry as a whistle. And the Lord has been there waiting for you. Waiting for you every day. To see if you'd show up. You may be in the thick of it right now, but the Lord is with you. The fire that was meant to destroy you, the fire that, that you have now is completely different. Because it's a fire that burns with you, that, has, that you have a passion for the Lord. I wanted to do something, but and I, I, I'll say it again. I wanted to bring like a little fire pit. I have bur had burned like three, you know, uh, brands. And just have them kind of charred and everything. But then I was thinking to myself, man, if I do that, I'll start pro I'll probably have soot all over my face, everywhere. And I was like, I, I got a feeling that it's going to get messy. But, you know, one thing that happens when you pluck out a brand from where the other brands are at or where the fire's at, if, it, if it's not connected to something else, it'll, it'll snuff out. It'll die out. Once it burns out, it's done. The secret to staying on fire is setting others on fire. It's setting others on fire. Setting others on fire. What does Proverbs tells us? I believe it's Proverbs 22, verse 17. Just as, a, as iron sharpens iron, so shall a man sharpen each other. Well, we need to sharpen each other. We got to do that continually. Not just once every month or who knows when, but it should be continually. Continually. Right, Juan? Every day, like he said. But let me tell you this. You were rescued from the fire to set others on fire. Now you touch others. Now you touch the next generation and set them on fire. Just like what Pastor Isaac is doing, investing in these young adults and the youth right now. He's trying to set them on fire because he sees what's coming next. We see what's coming next. And if there's not a generation on fire, what's going to happen? If we don't have a generation that can get the baton and say, you know what, you brought me to this distance, now I'm going to take it to this distance. 
That's why you guys are important. That's why all of you are important. All you little ones that think that, oh, I'm too small to be you. No, there, God can use you at any age. He's used my son when he was five years old. He used my 12-year-old. He's used my daughter at a certain age. Why? Because he's no respecter of persons. As long as there's a vessel that's being used in his hands, he'll use you. As long as you, you let yourself to be that vessel in his hands, he'll use you. Don't wait till you're all perfect. You'll be perfected as, he, you're, as long as you're being used by him. Don't wait till you're all cleaned up. Use your testimony. Use the dirt that the enemy has on you. Use it and glorify God. Glorify God. Just protect your fire. See, some disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus when Jesus came along. And he started walking alongside them. And then he started preaching to them. Started reciting scriptures. And in Luke chapter 12, verse 24, verse 32, this is what the Bible says. They said to each other, don't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And this was after Jesus had resurrected. So he resurrected and then he appeared to these followers. And then as he was having this conversation, they were like, man, didn't, our, didn't the word, didn't, as he was reading the scriptures, didn't it burn within us? And let me tell you this side note. The moment the, the, the moment the word stops to burn within you, when you read it, it's an indication that your fire is going out. Yeah. The moment when you start reading the Bible, you're reading the word. And it's no longer doing nothing in you. It's not burning and it's not convicting. It's not doing anything. The fire is going out. It's an indication that the fire is going out. And we've all been there. I've been there. And it, come, it comes to a point where you have to self-examine yourself. It comes to a point where you have to have another level of humility, another level of brokenness. And it's when you come to the Lord, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me or I'll die. When you come with that desperation and you say, Lord, I'm provoking that you will move. I'm provoking that you will touch me. I'm provoking that I will be filled in this moment. I'm provoking that I'll be set on fire, that people will be able to tangibly feel your divine presence. Something begins to change because there's a conviction within you that he says, I can't just read this just like any other book or a magazine or Reader's Digest or whatever you want to call it. This is the Holy Bible. This is the Holy Bible. So many people have fought for this word. And so and the enemy has also fought to take it away, take it away from public squares. Or you can't preach the word. See, it's easy to start on fire, but it's another thing to maintain on fire. You know, when someone loses their passion, the first thing that, that goes out is their worship. Their worship. They no longer worship. They no longer raise their hands. They no longer kneel. They no longer look for the Lord. They no, they're no longer going to that secret place. Worship goes, and then your devotion goes out the window. Next thing you know, your devotion ain't here to even come to the house of the Lord. Ah, right. oh, I'd rather be out boating. Oh, man, look, it's nice outside. I'd rather go play a game of soccer. Oh, no, nope, I'd rather throw that pigskin. I'd rather play football. I'd rather go do this. And next thing you know, you start adding these excuses. Excuse, excuse, what do you call it? Excuse, excuse. I don't know why. But I'm mixing everything. I was like, be careful because then the Spanish will come out too. <laughs> then the next thing you know, because I've done it like I'm preaching in Spanish and then the English wants to come out and then now I'm doing English and sometimes the Spanish wants to come out. Pero con de Dios hace algo. Algo comienza de ser a ti. Con de Dios te toque, te enciende en fuego. Eh, hey, eres un tizón que fuiste sacado del fuego. You were a brand that was plucked out of the fire. Because he's moving you to a greater place to set others on fire. See, David made sure that he always had passion for the Lord. Psalm 69 verse 9 says this. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those that insult you fall on me. See, David had this zeal. He's like, I have this zeal for your house, oh God. 
It burns it. I have this zeal for you. And I know I'm talking to a church here that, have, that, have a, that people here have a zeal for this house. They have a zeal to set others on fire. They have a zeal to open the word of God. They have a zeal to set others on fire. They have a zeal that the moment that they read the word, it's already burning within them as, as, as the moment they're digesting it. It'll get to a point that you will confess what the prophet Jeremiah said. In Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9. But if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak in his name, his word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I'm worn out trying to hold it in, and I can't do it. I can't do it. Has anybody been there where God put a word in you? And he's wanting you to release it to somebody? Yes. And you're shaking it off. And you're like, well, how do, how do I say this? I don't know these. I don't know them that well. Or, I don't, or how is he going to react? And you're starting to put logic behind everything. And then you're not moving. I've been there. I've been there. As a matter of fact, there was a testimony that I shared, and maybe I've shared it before. But I met this, uh, met this gentleman. I was at a gas station pumping gas, and I'm just looking around, and then I see another person pumping gas, and I just waved at him. He waved back. And then I'm like, how are you doing? How's your day going? Oh, great. And so we started this conversation from across different uh, the pumps. And then so we, we finished pumping gas, and then all of a sudden we both immediately walked towards each other. And then we introduced ourselves, and then he's like, hey, I want you to come and meet my wife. I'm like, okay. So I met his wife, and I was like, well, now I want, you to, I want both of you to come and meet my wife. And so now they, they, she gets out of the car, and they both come, and then I introduce them to my wife, and I started a conversation there, and then he's like, hey, can I get your number? I was like, sure. So I gave him my number. And then we started talking, texting, and everything. There was times we were getting together. I mean, I didn't know why. I was like, Lord, what is, what is this? Yeah. And I was like, is it a divine connection? Or what, what are you trying to do with this? So to cut the story short, well, there was one time out of the times that we met that I, I, I ended up inviting him over to the house. And then we were having coffee there. And as we were having coffee, the Lord begins to speak to me. And he's like, I want you to tell this give this message to, to her. And I'm like, what? I'm like, man, I was like, Lord, I was like, don't make it awkward. I was like, I barely met him like two, three weeks, and I'm, now you want me to give him a word? And he's like, no, I want you to give him that word. And I was like, so I told him, I was like, okay, Lord, if I'm listening to you, I want you to, and I'm hearing right, I want confirmation. Amen. Give me confirmation that what you're telling me is the exact word that that person needs. And he's like, okay. And then the next thing I know, man, she's like, ooh, what's happening to me? Ooh. She's like waving palms. She's like, I feel hot. I don't know what's going on. And, and, then, and then the Lord, see, I'm touching her. Release the word. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I was hoping I'd get out of it. So I'm like, okay, I'll be obedient, Lord. And so then I was like, hey, I got to stop the conversation and what we were just talking about. I was like, the Lord's telling me this. I was like, you've been praying and believing to get pregnant. You've been asking the Lord for a child. I was like, well, the Lord is touching you right now. What you were feeling right now is that the, the Lord was touching your womb. He was preparing you because you will be pregnant soon. I didn't give her the, the time frame. The Lord didn't give me the time frame. He just told me, tell her that I'm preparing her womb and that I'm touching her right now and she will be pregnant soon. I'm like, okay. So I released the word. She was crying, weeping. I left it as that and then we just continued our conversation. And then like a year passed or I don't know how long after that. And then I just kept getting this like in my spirit. I'm like... Man, I wonder what happened to the, this couple because I, I, we didn't keep on communication. And I was like, hmm. And I was like, why does this keep surf resurfacing? And I, and I was sharing it with, with my wife, and I was like, man, I was like, I keep getting this. This couple keeps coming back to my mind. I'm wondering if that, that word came to fruition. And at that time, there was times where she was going to translate at the, at the schools. And uh, she's like, hey, check your phone. I sent you something. I'm like, all right. So I'm waiting, nothing, and then all of a sudden I hear the little notification that I got something. And I look, and I'm like, oh, my Lord. So, so that, that same girl, the lady that I gave that word, um, she was, she, she's a teacher. I didn't know she was a teacher at, a, at one of the schools. And she was at the crosswalk, and she was pregnant. And I was like, oh, Lord, thank you, thank you. And I was like, because that, that filled me seeing somebody else's, you know, 
what, what they've been believing for, you know, that promise, or, or maybe they, they didn't even know that that could happen. They were going through a, a season, or who knows what, what, only the Lord knows what was happening in that couple, but they were believing for a child. But imagine if I wouldn't have released that word. Imagine if I wouldn't have been obedient to that word. That's why if the Lord's telling you to say something, make sure it's confirm. I mean, ask the Lord to confirm it. There's so many times in the Bible where the believers were asking for confirmation. Look at Gideon. Gideon asked so many times for confirmation. Look at Moses. There's nothing wrong. The only thing you're saying is, Lord, I don't want to say something if you didn't release it. I don't want to do something if you didn't tell me to do it. And that's why Moses said, where you go, I'll go. If you go, I'll go. If you don't go, I won't go. So release it. If God is telling you something, ask him for confirmation. And you'll know if it's biblical. You'll know if it's right on the dot. You know, there don't be that stirring. You can't shake it off like Jeremiah said. I mean, you're shaking it, trying to shake it, but that word is burning within you. It's burning and it's burning. See, listen, if you remove um, oxygen from, from, fire, from a fire, it'll go out. So when you stop speaking the word of God, when you stop speaking it over your life, over the life of others, what, what, what begins to happen is eventually their fire goes out and your fire goes out. Why? Because the Holy Spirit in Hebrew means Ruach HaKodesh, which means the breath of God. The breath of God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord tells us that he, that he formed man from the dust. And he breathed into his nostrils. And what did he do? He breathed life. Well, that word breathed life. In Hebrew, you look it up, it's Ruach HaKodesh, which is his spirit. The Bible says that his word is God breathed. So the moment you're using it, the moment you're speaking it into somebody's life, that's why all of a sudden they were in a place where they were in the pit. They were in the, in the worst place they can be. And the moment you start speaking the word of God, you keep believing, you keep telling them, hey, God has a plan. God has a future for you. God called you to be an ambassador. God called you to be an ambassador. God called you to be, he's calling you. But when you start speaking the word, something begins to happen in the inside of them. Something begins to change. Something begins to transform. Why? Because the, the, the word is a double-edged sword. But the one who's using it has to believe also in the word. That's how you begin to activate at a, at a different level. That the moment that you speak, something's going to shift. The moment you pray, something's going to shift. The mo it's, not, it's not a matter of, of if it will. No, you know that it's going to happen. You know that it's going to begin to activate. It's going to begin to penetrate those that are listening. That's what I do before I come. I know that I'm, 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 I'm speaking and I'm confessing. I was like, Lord, I know that the moment that I speak, it's going to begin to do something. It's going to begin to transform people's lives. It's going to begin to penetrate their hearts. It'll, it'll bring conviction. Not because I'm bringing it. It'll be because the Holy Spirit's bringing it. And then it begins to change. It begins to activate. It begins to do something amazing. But you have to speak the word. You have to speak it over your life. I love what one of the elders, Roy Bauer, has taught me. And it's confessions. Confessions. If you want to know how to confess something, go talk to Roy. He's going to be like, hey, I'm bombarded now. No, but Roy knows how to confess. He confesses the scripture over his life. He has sent me confessions before, just like Pastor Marlando. Confessions are powerful, especially when you're using the Word of God. So that's why the Word of God has power. That's why when someone is down and you speak it over their life, it lifts them up. Maybe they were, they were in depression. They were in oppression. Maybe they were even having suicidal thoughts. But the moment the Word began to touch them, something changed. The, then the chains break. Then the yoke is lifted off. Things begin to change. Then that's when a generation begins to move. Why? Because they're free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Oh, I better hurry up. John Wesley was kicked out of so many places because he was trying to preach.
preach the word. He was preached, I mean, he was, uh, he was kicked out of churches for preaching the word. Out of churches. And you might, you might be thinking, man, well, what kind of preaching was he preaching? Being kicked out. He went to public squares, got kicked out. He went to different places, was getting kicked out out of everywhere. So he didn't give up. What he ended up doing, he ended up going to stadiums that were empty. He went to parks that were empty. But the key to this was this phrase that he said. John Wesley, and I'm going to quote this. He said, light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from miles to watch you burn. They'll put it on the screen. Light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from afar to watch you burn. Why? Because fire is attractive. If you're on fire, people will come to watch you burn. If you're on fire, they'll come and to come, they'll want, they want to come to listen to you. They want to come to be around you. They want you to even hug them. They want you to even to handshake them. Why? Because fire is attractive. Fire is attractive. And that's why we should be attracted to the Holy Spirit. Dunamis power. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Now that you've been plucked out of the fire, what happens? It takes us to the next point. Now you're refined and with new garments. Stained garments to now putting new garments was the cleansing of Israel by the Messianic priest. That's what was happening in that time. But you can apply this by what? Because we have all had stained garments. Who has had stained garments at one point? It was, we all had stained garments before we came to Christ. We had those stained garments. Garments where the enemy was always pointing out, singling you out. Oh, look at this. He's never going to do anything. He's always going to be broke, disgusted. He'll never do anything. He'll never do anything for you. And he's telling this to the Lord. He even tried to do this to Job. Even Job was righteous man. But he's like, oh, he's like, let me put him to the test. Let me take everything away from him. I, I can guarantee you he'll even curse you. He'll even curse you the moment I take everything away. And if you look at the, at the order of the way the enemy began to strike, he took away the animals. Why? Because then he couldn't sacrifice nothing. Because then there was, he couldn't form no hedge of protection. Because it was always, it's always been the blood that protects us. In the Old Testament, that's why they would sacrifice animals. For the cleansing and the protection. So once he removed the animals, no blood. So he had all access. Then he started taking everything out. His kids, his wife, you name it. I mean, he was left with nothing. And then he was waiting, 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 waiting to see if he'd curse God. And how many have been in a situation that you haven't even been as bad as Job had, but you curse God? You curse God. You even said, where are you in the midst of this? You begin to question. You begin to question God Almighty. But it's always a refining process. He removes these garments because these garments are filthy. These garments are, are dirty. There's impurity. There's sin. Because the enemy wants to continue to use that. So the Lord says, nah, -uh. I'm going to remove them. But that refining process, that's what takes you to that place. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. I'm going to read out of the Good News translation. It says, be glad about this. Even though it may be necessary for you to be sad for a while because of the many kinds of trials you suffer. Their purpose is to prove that your faith is genuine. Even gold which can be destroyed is tested by fire. And so your faith, which is more precious than gold, must also be tested so that it may endure. Then you will receive a praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. When Christ Jesus is revealed. See, so many people complain about the storms. I've done it. I've been there. Why me, Lord? Have you ever said that? Why me? Why, why is it me that I, have, that I have to go through this? But we should be asking, Lord, what are you teaching me through this? And let me tell you this, if it wasn't for that storm, that fire would have been out a long time ago. Because sometimes, even though the Lord didn't bring that storm towards you, 
but the word says that he uses everything good for our for us according to his goodness you know he uses everything for our good no matter what even though he wasn't the one that brought it but he'll use it for our good so the moment you're going through that storm the moment you're going through that process it's that moment where you got to press in more that's the moment where you got to kneel more that's where you got to pray more when i was going through the the storm when when my my son daniel when he was in the womb that nobody knew that the diagnosis said that he was going to have Down syndrome. I was, we were starting a Daniel fast. First couple of days and then we get this news. And I'm like, uh-uh. That ain't going to happen. We began to fight. And I told that nurse, well, because the nurse called and he's like, well, I'm telling you this in case you guys want to um, do you know what. Not have them. And I'm like, you know what. I don't, I don't, I'm not taking that report. I rebuke that report. And so I continue to press in. And through the conversations through my wife and I, we were like, we don't know where this test is coming from. Whether it's coming from God or whether it's coming from the enemy. And so I began to press in and ask the Lord questions. Lord, is this coming from you? Am I being tested with my son? And he's like, no. He's like, remember... You asked me, you wanted another son, but you wanted it dedicated to me before conception. Because before you weren't a believer, but now you're a believer and you're like, I want to dedicate this son to you from the very beginning before I even have him because I was acting in faith. They're all dedicated to the Lord, my daughter and my, my other son. But, the, but, but Daniel, because like I said, it was at the beginning, before we even had him, we, now we knew the things of God. And I was like, okay, Lord. I was like, I want you to also give him the calling. I want to know his calling. I want to know his calling too. I was like, and I want you to give me the name for him. And he's like, all right, I'll give you the name, and the name will tell you his calling. So one night we were up saying, we're trying to think of all these biblical names. We couldn't come into an agreement. And then she fell asleep. And I'm still up thinking. I'm like, man, I'm like, and I'm rambling, still names. And finally, I fell asleep. In the morning, I woke up with one name in my mouth. And I looked at her. Hey, I forgot about this name. And I said it, Daniel. And, and then she's like, yes, we'll name him Daniel. We came straight in an agreement right then and there. And his calling is to be a prophet. <clears throat> to be a prophet. And he's like, that's why the enemy was fighting so hard. So he wouldn't be born. But see, all of you have a calling. Each and one of you has a calling. The thing is to find out what God is calling you to. What's your assignment? What does God want to do in your, in your life and through you? See, let me give you a side note. Many people want the benefits of the cross. But they don't want to carry the cross. They want everything that's attached to what Jesus did. The promises, the healing, the restoration, the deliverance. I mean, you name it, everything that Jesus stands for and what he did on the cross. But nobody wants to carry the cross because the cross will cost you. See, everybody wants a resurrected life, uh, wants to live a resurrected life, but without crucifying the flesh. I'll say it again. People want to live a resurrected life but without ever crucifying the flesh. I want you to say new garments. This is what Jesus does. He removes your old garments and gives us new garments that are washed by his precious blood. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 4 through 5, and I'm closing with this scripture. The Bible says this. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I, have, and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. See how great isn't the Lord. How, how good is the Lord? That he's like, you know what? Even though Joshua had the filthy garments, he didn't see them that way. 
He doesn't see you with all the filth and all the muck. He sees the gold in you. And you got to surround yourself that people will see the same thing, the, the gold in you. Stop surrounding yourself with people that only pull you down, that only tear you down every time you're trying to take a step forward and say that you're never going to amount to nobody, that you're not going to be nobody, that you're never going to do this, that you're never going to succeed. Surround yourself with people that will believe in you, that will, that will lift you up on the days that you need to be lifted up because we all need Somebody, I'm going to ask the worship team if they can come forward, please. So now that, you have gar now that you have new garments, you have garments of salvation now. You have garments, you have garments of praise. You have garments of righteousness. You have a, now garments of a new wineskin. And Brian was singing something at the beginning, and he was talking about wedding garments. Wedding garments. Man, the Lord is so good that he will remove that filth and give you something new. See, this whole message has been about the cross. There's an exchange that happens. Jesus is always found in every book in the Old Testament. And he's found in the Old Testament in every... In every book, you will find Jesus. You will find Jesus. At the end, when I was almost finishing the message and I was just kind of going over it, the Lord just kept giving me more revelation, kept giving me more stuff, and I'm like, I was like, I got to stop. I was like, or I'm going to end up writing a book or something. And, but it, it's awesome what he does because sometimes you're starting and you're like, well, how is this going to look? How do you, you, you know what I'm talking about, Pastor Isaac, right? Pastor Bond, we're going through the process and we're not sure how it's going to be laid out. And then the Lord just begins to give you the next point, begins to fill this, begins to give you the revelation. And, and now, and the way I was, he was teaching me this and he was showing me this. I was like, the whole thing with the, the garment plucked out of the fire and all that, it's a representation of the prodigal son too. Because what did the king do? When he saw his son, he gave him new garments. He saw him from afar, and he didn't wait until he got to him. He ran to him. The Lord isn't just waiting. I'm going to see when, when he'll wake up, when he'll decide to, to knock on the door. What? He's already at the door. He's just waiting for you to open it, to dine with him. He has already prepared a table. And he's to prepare the table before your enemies. What's at the table is already there for you. You have access to what's on the table. All you have to do is just sit down. Sometimes we're fighting so much for what's at the table when it already belongs to you. All you have to do is sit down and have communion with the Lord. And you'll begin to see how these things begin to flow. Everything belongs to you already. Look at the order of the book of Genesis. Before he created man, he created the provision. So why are we so much fighting for provision when it's already there for us? It's already there. See, you got to read, you got to ask yourself when you're reading the word, ask yourself questions. Put yourself in, in the story. Man, another example that the Lord's given me. Genesis, I believe it's chapter 9, after the flood. What was the first thing that Noah did? He, af he offered a sacrifice. See, the sacrifice was so pleasing to the Lord. It was so pleasing that he made a covenant with man. A sacrifice that touched him so much that he decided to make a covenant with man. That's powerful. Have you ever brought something to the altar? Have you ever brought a sacrifice to the altar where the Lord makes a covenant with you? What have you brought to him? I remember when I brought a sacrifice. I was at a dance, had my beer garden bracelet, 
had been, I had already a couple drinks with the couples that were there. Then the song came out, and I'm like, tomorrow, let's go dance. And as I'm walking, the Lord begins to speak to me. Edgar, why do you keep drinking? Why do you keep drinking? And I'm like, Lord, I'm just had one or two drinks. I was like, I'm not even drunk or buzzing. And so I'm just arguing with the Lord and just telling him this. And then he asked me again, no, Edgar, why do you keep drinking? And I'm like, okay. So I asked him, I was like, Lord, well, I was like, do you want me to quit drinking? And then, so he asked me this question. He's like, if somebody sees you with one drink in your hand, are they going to think that you've changed or you're still your old self? Mm. I was like, I never saw it that way because I could have had just one drink in my hand. But if somebody would have seen me, they would have been like, oh, I saw him. And actually something like that did happen. My wife can testify. I had a friend that somebody had already told him, was like, hey, Edgar is all religious now. He's all into the Bible. He's all into this. It's only a a phase. And he'll go back to, he'll revert back to his ways. But he, I was like, he's completely different now. I was like, so don't even talk to him. I was like, well, I was like, well, that's weird. I was like, well, I saw him at the dance and he was drinking. That was the day that the Lord was correcting me. So as a sacrifice, I brought myself. Even though I was there walking with my wife, my wife didn't know the conversation I was having with the Lord. And I'm like, I was like, Lord, I'm here. I'm here. I give you everything. And he's like, I want you to quit drinking. I was like, okay, Lord. I will never touch alcohol from here on, from here on out. I never, until this day, I haven't touched alcohol again. But it was through his strength that I was willing to bring it to him. I've shared my testimony numerous times. For me, it never gets old. Why? Because that's where he pulled me out of. See, the moment you make your testimony become ordinary, instead of extraordinary, it loses its power. You begin to stain it. If you begin to revert back to those things, it doesn't become a testimony anymore. That's why you have to guard and protect your testimony. Guard and protect your testimony. I'm going to ask if everyone could stand, please. Can you guys turn the lights down a little bit? I want you to go ahead and close your eyes, bow your heads. And I don't know if you were through the message. You could say, and I'm, I feel like I've been that person. I feel like I've been that prodigal son. I feel like I've been in that fire, in that storm. I feel like I'm that brand. Or I feel like I got those filthy garments right now. But there needs to be an exchange. If you feel that God is tugging on you. You know, tomorrow's not promised. You don't know what could happen. You don't know what could happen, but eternity is real. And you could either spend eternity in hell or you can spend eternity in heaven with the Father. But if today the Lord is knocking in your heart, welcome him in. Welcome him. And say, I'm here, Lord. I'm here, Lord. With every eye closed and every head bowed. If there's somebody here that needs to give their life to Jesus, I want to pray with you. And when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Is there anybody here that needs to give their life to Jesus? That says, you know what? I'm here. I want to give myself to the Lord. Is there anybody here that wants to give their life to Jesus? I want you to raise up your hand high so I can see you. Okay. So everybody's saved here. So we got work to do. But I also want to do another altar call. Because I know the condemnation is real. I know the accusations are real. And if you've been having issues removing those filthy garments the Lord already removed them for you but the problem is that you keep putting them back on you keep putting those garments back on and you say well I deserve this oh people look at me this way see people will look at you the way that you, the, the way you look at yourself if you change everything changes 
But if you have filthy garments and you're like, I'm tired of carrying this. It's been weighing me down. I don't want them no more. I want the exchange. I want to receive those new garments, the garments of praise, the garments of righteousness, the garments that you have given me and prepared for me, oh Lord. Or maybe you've lost your fire and you just need a touch of fire again. Maybe you haven't been surrounded with those that could set you back on fire. The altar is open for anybody who wants to come up. And I'm in no hurry. The Holy Spirit will draw you out. He knows where the condition you're at. He knows where you're at in this moment, in this very hour. But if you want a fresh touch of his presence, come to the altar. Come to the altar. As Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, come boldly. Come as a living sacrifice. Come as a living sacrifice. If you come as that living sacrifice, the Lord will consume you. I've been there. And I constantly go, Lord, touch me. Lord, touch me. I've gotten to a point where I've been like, David, Lord, if I don't hear from you, I will die. But because there's a cry within me, because it's the brokenness, humility, that's what the Lord wants. He wants you to let go of pride. He wants you to let go of those things. And just say, you know what? I'm here, Lord. I'm here, Lord. I'm here, Lord. We've all been there. Hear my heart because I've been there. I've been in the trenches where I felt like my fire was like wanting to go out. But I fought. I continue to fight. Why? Because I will protect my devotion. I will protect my fire for the Lord. I will protect it. And I know there's some of you that should be up here. You should be running. You should be saying, Lord, consume me, oh God. Touch me right now because I don't know what's going to happen after I leave these doors. And maybe it needs to get real. And it's been getting real this whole time. But you've been pushing it to the side. You've been pushing it to the side. You've been pushing it to the side. But there's something when you grab a hold of the Lord with faith and you provoke him. You, Lord, you say, Lord, I'm not going to let you go until I provoke that your presence surrounds me, submerges me. And you just let him, you just let him, 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 let him. Just yield to the Holy Spirit. Yield to him, yield to him, yield to him. The Holy Spirit is here. He'll take the room if you give him the room. He'll take the room as long as you give him the room. So give the room to your heart. Give them room.
in every crown. Yeah, come on. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Yeah. And here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. Yeah. This is my surrender. This is my, and I will make room for you hey. to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make room. Whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to.
once more, he just got out of camp, Father God. But once more, and those that belong, those that want more, shall be filled, shall be filled in the name of Jesus. And let the Lord increase the fire, the presence, the glory, because that's all we want to do. We want to be in the midst. I want you this week, I want you to say something when you're praying. I prepare a place for you, oh God. I prepare a place for you. I prepare a place for you, Lord, where I want you to be in the midst of where I'm at, Lord, but that you would consume the room, that you would consume where I'm at, but that there's a cry, there's a genuine cry that says, I don't want nothing else but you, Lord. I don't want nothing else but you in your presence, God. That your glory surrounds me, that your glory is upon me. The Shanika glory. I thank you right now, Lord. I thank you for what you've done and what you will continue to do. I thank you that we're living the greatest moments that wherever your sons and daughters go, signs and wonders will follow them because everything is possible to them that believe, to those that provoke, provoke, provoke. If you feel nothing's happening, you keep provoking. Like Pastor Bob was saying, you keep knocking. That door, that door will open up. That door will open up. And many of you here need some doors open. And some of them need to be closed. So just seek, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. We can experience this every day. Every day. Every day. The secret is in the secret room. That's it. That's the secret. The more you seek them in the private, that's what you will see manifested in the public. See, people have it backwards. They want to manifest something in the, pu- in the public that they've never even done in the private. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Fast, fast. Come on. You younger generation, fast. Come on. Learn the discipline of fasting. Come on. Fasting, fasting is the key. The Bible says that some some demonic spirits won't come out through prayer only, but through prayer and fasting. This generation needs to learn how to fast. And I'm not just talking about your favorite drink or fasting to watch it. No, no. A true fast. Abstinence from food. No food. That's when you begin to tell the Lord, Lord, I don't desire that hamburger. I don't desire that carne asada even though it's good. Or those tacos. And you say, I don't desire that. I desire more of your presence. And even when you're hungry, even when your stomach is growling, and you're saying these things to the Lord, the Lord begins to see that. And then he begins to manifest. Then he begins to show you, oh, my son is hungry for my presence. My son, my daughter is hungry for my presence. How could I say no to that? If they're provoking, if they're desiring me to be there in the midst of them, that's all it is. Seek them. Seek them. Well, God bless you, church. Thank you for being here with us. It was an honor. It was an honor to fill for my pastor. And come expect it next Sunday and believe that we're living in the greatest times right now. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, worship team. God bless.